Ahead of the People's Democratic Party presidential primary election slated for 28th of May 2022, the party sources said the zoning committee led by Benue State Governor Samuel Atom has thrown open the ticket. After three meetings in the last two weeks, many governors on the platform of the PDP from the South are agitating that the ticket be zoned to the South, while the PDP members in the North and presidential aspirant from the North want zoning jettisoned. But addressing journalists after the meeting, Autumn says the committee unanimously adopted a position that will be forwarded to the National Executive Committee of the party. Unanimously adopted a position that will be sent to the neck of our party that appointed us. So uh, the good news for our teaming supporters of the PDP and Nigerians is that we have resolve. And every one of us, the 37 members, unanimously adopted the position we are going to present to next. All right. Tundu, your take on this first of two stories. Well, I suppose it's a good sign for PDP that they were unable to reach a unanimous decision after having to postpone this announcement a few times. So all the negotiations and what have you clearly bore fruit. But who does it actually benefit if the race is thrown open rather than zoned? The answer to that is quite obvious. Mm. So I'm sure there's some people who are you know, mildly displeased at the very least mm. by this turn of events. And it also raises a question about the PDP constitution, of which Article 7, subsection 3, C states very clearly that party and public positions are to be rotated. You know, there are some people that have a different interpretation of that, saying that it's within the PDP, so that zoning it, like zoning to the south, is actually running foul of that Article 7 provision, since the last president from the PDP was from the south. There's that argument, which I think tends to stretch things quite a bit, but, you know, some people are convinced by it. But, you know, talking about how they had to reach this decision because of the exigency of time, I'm not sure is entirely convincing. It seems to me to be more like about political expediency. Mm. Dr. Batu? Yes, certainly it's about political expediency. It's also about pragmatism. And maybe we should take a look at the background. You will recall that, uh, you know, northern stakeholders within the party, the PDP, insisted that this time around the uh, zoning should come to the north. And at this meeting, the 37 member zoning committee, at least three persons, former governor of uh, Jigawa State, Sule Lamido, uh, Alaji Kawubaraji uh, of, uh, from uh, Kwara State, and uh, one other person, uh, Senator Abdul Ningi, uh, argued that, look, it should be zoned, the position should be zoned to the north. Or if that will not happen, then it should be thrown open. Okay. At the end of the day, after the deliberations, it was decided that it should be uh, thrown open to create a level playing ground uh, to give everybody an opportunity to make a bid for the position. Now, why do I say that it is uh, pragmatic? Uh, you recall that in 2015, one of the reasons why the PDP lost uh, the election was because the northern stakeholders within the party felt that... Uh, President Jonathan should not go for a second term. And at the uncompleted two and a half years, two, two years, 13 months of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Yara Dua presidency that had been used uh, by President Jonathan in his capacity previously as vice president of the country, necessitated a situation whereby, you know, the presidency should go back to the north. But that did not happen within the PDP. And hence, although many of the PDP stakeholders in the North uh, went through the motions of the campaign, many of them worked against the party. And I think it's that tendency within the party that is now, you know, very strong and now saying, look for the PDP to move forward. The uh, zoning of the presidency must come back to the North. Actually, what they have in mind is choosing a Northern uh, uh, candidate to assuage uh, the Northern stakeholders within the uh, political party. But it makes sense to say we have thrown it uh, open. So part of the subtext is about that 
Yaradua presidency, the two years, 13 months that the South used within the party. And the betrayal that uh, Northern stakeholders imposed on the party uh, in 2015, resulting in part, uh, you, other people may have some other reasons, but this was a very, uh, very strong part of it. So there's that part of it. Now, uh, there's this talk about uh, exigency of uh, time. What is the exigency of time? Uh, Samuel Otom, Governor of Benue State, will be here on this program. Maybe we will ask him to explain what the exigency of time is all about. The APC, when the APC adopted the zoning formula, in fact, the same APC was quoting the PDP and saying that, look, we want to follow the example of the PDP and adopt zoning as a principle. But the same party that is known for zoning says, well, we have found the zoning principle which is in our party constitution, but we think this time around, you know, we can do without it. So what you find here is the triumph of a certain tendency within the party. And it is not for nothing that you find Northern stakeholders in the party, particularly those who are bought forms, uh, their camp jubilating, the camp of Tambua, of Atiku Abubaka, and of other, you know, uh, Northern stakeholders, including Bala Mohammed, who have said, look, this should be thrown open. Now, what uh, does this mean for Southern stakeholders? Well, Southern stakeholders within the party are, of course, aggrieved. The uh, uh, Oanese Indigo uh, wing of the party has issued a statement saying that this is an act of injustice that should not be allowed to stand, and that, look, the appropriate thing to do will have been to zone the uh, presidency of the uh, 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 of the PDP position to the southeast. The Middle Belt Forum, uh, speaking through his spokesperson, a certain Robinson, has also complained. Pandev, the south south wing of the party, has also uh, uh, complained. But I think by the time the National Executive uh, Committee sits, the National Executive Committee is also most likely to withhold, you know, to sustain the position of the, uh, of the 37 man. Uh, uh, committee that arrive at that decision that the position should be thrown uh, open. And, you know, there will be certain elements within the party who will say that this is perhaps also a pragmatic way of stopping the likes of uh, Governor Ian Somwike, you know, from hijacking uh, the party. Hi, mm. Whatever it is, we'll see how that drama will play out. Uh, it's been said it's a level uh, open field and all that, but I can tell you I, I have an idea of the direction in which they, they are going. Mm. You know, the uh, other candidates that are not from the North, they can go through the motion, but nothing mm. may come out of it. Why? Because if you look at it, the major uh, Northern contenders uh, who are interested in running on the platform of the party, uh, Bukola Saraki, Tambua, uh, representatives of uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubaka and uh, Bala Mohammed. This week alone, they visited two governors. They were in Ibadan on uh, Monday, right, where they met with uh, Governor uh, Sheyi Makinde. And what were they pushing? Consensus, consensus, consensus candidacy. So they are, they are saying that the PDP should also adopt the idea of consensus. If it's the idea of consensus, it means that many of these other 13 aspirants on the platform of the PDP, you know, many of them do not stand any chance. Mm. When they left Ibadan, they went straight to Akwaibom to meet with uh, Emmanuel Udom of uh, Akwaibom State, PDP governor in Akwaibom State. The other issue also is consensus candidacy. So you are likely to find a situation whereby the PDP uh, will just sit down, the governors will sit down, the same as we have seen in the APC, and they will just take a decision mm. and say, this is a man who is going to run. The final leg of that analysis has to do with how will the APC respond? We have said that from what the APC has done so far, it looks like the APC has zoned the presidency to the, uh, to the south. But well, maybe we shouldn't be too sure yet. Because if the uh, uh, PDP chooses its candidate from the north, maybe the north central, maybe the northwest, the APC too may, on account of that, take a different uh, route. Because the PDP, ending the zoning meeting, the uh, zoning committee meeting, 
was saying that more of the votes come from the north. Out of the 10 uh, major states that voted for the PDP in the 2019 general election, only one came from the south, Lagos. Lagos yeah. And so Just they are saying that, look, the bulk of the vote comes from the north, so we cannot gamble. Whether they are right on that score or not, whether that is based on data or not, whether that data is correct or not, mm -hmm. is one of those issues that we debate in Nigeria. So would the APC, seeing that kind of argument, then allow the, uh, the PDP to run away with the price? So the APC is also likely to respond in the long run. But early days yet, within eight weeks, we'll know where the pendulum will swing. So those SADA members in the APC uh, should not begin to jubilate yet. The, the game could go in any direction because it's politics. This mm. is pragmatism. Mm. And it looks like there are hidden hands that are trying to tailor the future of Nigeria. One thing I'll say to this is the PDP has officially shot itself in the foot. And the PDP will pay dearly for it. And this just goes to show that politics is a game of what gets, who gets what, when, and how. In all of this, the PDP did not consider the, the zeitgeist of the nation, the need for power to return to the South, which is the cry of everybody. What they considered was the interest of some stakeholders in their party, which we all know very well. Last year, or I think early this year, Uguayi, Governor Uguayi of Enugu State and a couple of other governors had a meeting and they resolved that power should be zoned to the south. The national body of the PDP was quick to kick against that because some interest for them was more than the aspirations and the hopes of the people of Nigeria. So this might just be a watershed in the, in the PDP. This case is as terrible as what happened in the APC party primaries. A lot of people are going to be disgruntled in this political party. Because when you look at the logical argument of, oh, it is only a northerner that can win presidential elections in this country, that argument doesn't hold water. We've had people in this country that ran a Muslim Muslim ticket and they were not from the north and they won elections convincingly in the north. So this argument the PDP has been making that, oh, our best chance, our path to presidency because every political party is set up to win elections. And it has to be a northern candidate that can win that election. It's an aberration. And in fact, it's an insult to other candidates out there that have the same national spread. Or be they might not have the money these stakeholders have. And you'll see the repercussions. And the PDP forgets that it is Nigerians that vote, not members of the PDP. And I'm the voice of the streets, and this is what the streets are saying. Oh, well, wow. I said that politics, yes. I said that politics doesn't work that it way. It doesn't work that way. It's a, but, it's but, a, it's a heterogeneous country. It's a heterogeneous in country. In the north, in the 19 states of the north, mm. they don't think it's a ton of the south. If another northerner could come in, the average northerner would be happy. Dr. Abati, that, do you, that, have, do you have an empirical proof of that analysis? Do you no. have an empirical number-to-number no. number proof no, average, that an average no. northerner would not accept a southern president no, as the, we speak? No, the sentiment in the north is that the No, power, that's sentiment, but it's not empirical. Well, the, you know, sentiment, politics is driven by sentiment. But it's not empirical. No, it's not driven by data. It's driven it's, by sentiments. Okay. People vote because of sentiments, okay. not because they think this man is the best. And northerners want power back, and you can see... Uh, the PDP shifting in that direction. And that's why I said, don't be surprised if the APC also shifts in that direction. I mean, it's now for the Southerners yeah. to say, well, this is what we want. Time will tell. And then, of course, the South, even itself, is not monolithic. No, the South is not monolithic, accepted, yeah. granted. The North is not monolithic. The either, but the analogy and this constant push of it is only a northern candidate that can win elections for a political party at a point in time like this in Nigeria. The entitlement. Is the strong. entitlement mentality mm. is what a lot of people will kick against. And I repeat, PDP should remember 
And it's Nigerians that still get their votes in, not members of the PDP. We have another story. Moving on to more stories. Terrorists are still on the prowl in Kaduna, northwest Nigeria. About 15 soldiers and three civilians were reportedly killed by terrorists in an attack on a military camp at a place called uh, Poliwai in Berningwari local government area of Kaduna State. The terrorists were said to be traveling from Niger State to Zamfara State in large numbers, via Berningwari reportedly launching a deadly attack on the military camp. News sources say the terrorists overpowered the soldiers due to their large numbers, and the terrorists were said to have burnt military ammo tanks at the camp. Another sad one to do. Desperately sad. It does appear that somebody has declared open season on Kaduna. It's been just a litany of disasters, from that attack mm. on the airport that cost one um, official his life, to the horrendous terrorist attack on the train. The inspector general of police went and declared the highway safe. There was a terrorist attack just after, to really just make a complete nonsense of those assurances. Aqua Ibom had to evacuate their indigents mm. to safety. What is happening in Kaduna is terrifying. There's no other word for it. The governor of Kaduna has talked about how the security officials know exactly where these people are. They intercept their conversations and they need to just go and bomb them. They just need some kind of blitzkrieg. But that has not happened yet. Maybe it's the considerations of the collateral damage that could that will occur in mm. terms of human life. Because these terrorists, even with this murderous rampage, the most recent one, they tend to kill as well as abduct. So there's so many hostages in their custody at the moment. So I, that might be why. Or there's also the more sinister motivation that's been suggested in a lot of quarters, that there is just complicity, that this um, situation continues because it is being maintained, it's been fueled by people who are benefiting from this situation. But mm. all I do know is that we're nearing the end of the Buhari administration. Mm. And he had his C agenda, didn't he, of which security is the S in that, you know, um, those set of initials. And this is, is an abysmal failure from where I'm standing with regards to what is happening right now. The people of Kaduna cannot sleep with both eyes closed. Nobody can. As of last year, when you take the average, 14 Nigerians were killed every single day, every day in this country last year. The highest numbers were in Zamfara and Kaduna. And this year, the trend is continuing so far. It's completely unacceptable and it has to stop. Mm. Well, in the last few days, we have heard about the uh, police hierarchy, the IGP in particular, saying that it was going to deploy a strong detachment of policemen, not just to protect people uh, reconstructing the damaged rail lines uh, in regional and that axis, but also that drones will be deployed. The Nigerian Air Force had said Super Tucano jets will be deployed. The governor of uh, Kaduna State had said he was going to meet with the pre uh, president and that uh, the military should wake up and begin to bomb the hideouts known to them and also to pay more attention to the telephone uh, numbers of the terrorists from which both the Department of State Services can get uh, quality intelligence and they've been getting intelligence, uh, but uh, the state has refused to act. Okay, we saw all that uh, chest beating uh, by the state uh, after the... Uh, uh, bombing of the uh, uh, Kaduna bound train from Abuja. And then just a few days later, in fact, not just a few days later, almost immediately, there was an attack in the Suleja area in Doko. And now we're told that another military uh, formation has been established. What rankles here is the audacity of the terrorists, mm. the confidence with which non state actors take up the Nigerian state, seek to overwhelm it seem to uh, uh, degrade it, uh, seek to compromise its integrity, and the state just appears helpless. In the latest account, we were told that about 11 soldiers were killed. So where is the state? The question asked by, uh, by uh, uh, Governor Nasir Rufai, where is the state? The same question asked by uh, 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 President uh, Obasanjo, where is the state? The same question asked by uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Nuru Khalid, mm. who luckily has been given another job by another mosque that is far more progressive than the conservative uh, mosque that they have in uh, Akpo legislative uh, quarters. Where is the state? The same question asked by uh, uh, Most Reverend Ignatius Kagama of the Pro Cathedral, uh, the Catholic Pro Cathedral in Abuja. And the question asked by many in uh, 
uh, Nigerians. So what all this means is that the state has not been able, like the Nigerian state, qua state, that is, has not been able to respond to this challenge. And what has happened in this latest attack is a subtle reminder that all of us were in a dark place. And the bigger fear that people have raised, two, one, that we face the danger of even the federal capital territories have been overrun. And we face the danger of these terrorists becoming so bold that they could compromise the 2023 election process. And maybe that is why uh, the uh, general overseer of the uh, Redeemed Christian Church of God says that he has not yet heard from God yet about the possibility of the 2023 elections taking place. And there are others who have made similar statements. And I think it would be unfortunate if the 2023 process were to be derailed by non-state actors who may succeed in overwhelming the state, who may succeed in violating the will of the Nigerian people and the constitution of the people, which is a government, a president, a governor, an elected person, can only have a term of uh, just four years. I know that the constitution uh, somewhere there provides for an extension for about six months. I hope that you will not have that kind of anarchic situation because that will be a major blow to the legacy of President uh, Muhammad Ubari because it will be on record that it was under his watch that elections could not hold in Nigeria. So we, 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 we throw the uh, buck back to the desk of the president mm. and his team that they must do everything possible to make sure that there is an enabling environment for transition because his government is also overseeing a major transition in Nigeria's democratic process. Those are the indications, in my view. All right. That's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break. When we we'll return, we'll have Rotus, we'll have Adesua, we'll have Aero to give updates on Africa, business, COVID-19, and sport and activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Morning Show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rosa Sadiri is here to give us an African business update. Good morning, Rosa. Good morning, Sundu. Good morning, Rafai. Good, good morning, morning Doctor. Yeah, we begin um, in Abuja, where uh, Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Timmy Pre Silva, uh, is urging the uh, Nigerian liquefied nat uh, natural gas, L NLNG, to boost outputs uh, to European nations. He's saying that the uh, share, sh you know, the uh, shareholders, NPC, of course, has a majority shareholding with uh, Shell. ENI, Total Energies, they're blocking efforts to increase outputs to Europe. As we know, Europe desperately wants to um, diversify away from imports of uh, natural gas from Russia. Uh, and what uh, Timmy Presilva was saying, now he said this while he was in Abuja state capital re receiving Italy's new ambassador to Nigeria, I think it's Stefano Di, De, De, De Leo. And this statement that was, that, uh, was captured by the media, apparently he said that if they allow third parties to you know, provide extra feedstock um, to NLNG, which gets some of its feedstock from, from, um, um, from, the, from those parties, if it was to get those extra third parties, they would increase a capacity to export to European nations. But the problem with this is that, well, I mean, um, LNG, despite the fact that it's a joint venture between the NNPC and these, uh, the Shell, ENI, Total, and so on, those are private companies. And, um, you know, he's going to have to work at persuading them instead of trying to force them and saying that they are, they are blocking efforts to increase output. Um, sharing your pipelines with third parties, there could be some risks as far as making sure that um, the, 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 the content of the um, LNG is actually, you know, is up to standard. Um, we know that you know Shell, for example, has had issues with um, ITO, ongoing matters with um, you know assets that were transferred over to them. So there's also an opportunity here beyond trying to put pressure on uh, NLNG shareholders to get FDI from Europe. With Europe being incredibly, and I'll explain, with Europe being incredibly desperate um, to cycle away from energy imports from Russia, to me, Priscilla could say, hey, why don't you bring? 50 billion euros and um, invest in uh, infrastructure here to increase capacity that can um, increase outputs um, to your shores. Um, because we already have existing um, gas projects, in Nigeria gas, you know, plan, master plan and so on and so forth, uh, Ajaokiza pipelines and so on and so forth through the northern parts of the country that are still starved of funding in order to get to where they need to be. So 
this is, is an opportunity to wheel and deal and get Europe to invest more here. So, but as far as the um, parties are concerned, they didn't actually release any comments uh, in response to what he said. So that's still something that I guess is, uh, is ongoing. Um, the wider African narrative, so there's some, look at some uh, purchasing managers index numbers, figures from, I think about six or seven African nations, which showed that the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war is actually having um, an impact on, on them. This, these are so PMI numbers that were put together by S&P Global, Stambik IBTC, Standard Bank. February is in white, uh, March is in uh, yellow. And you'll notice that, so starting from the left, Ghana, it, so the, the threshold here is 50 points. If you're above 50, you're expanding. If you're below 50, you're contracting. Ghana, we know the issues they've been having. So 49.6 points is their purchasing managers index, which is a survey where you go and talk to manufacturers and find out how things are going. It dropped to 47.2 in, in March, so contracted further. Zambia was at, right at the threshold of 50.3, contracted to 49.6. Kenya, we know the issues they're having, 52.9, although they're, they're right at 50, dropped to 50.5. Mozambique. They are at 51.2, dropped to 50. Uganda, Nigeria, only South Africa that actually increased from February's 50.9 figure to 50.1. So businesses there, manufacturers facing all types of input cost pressures um, based on the supply chain issues that have been excavated, starting from COVID now, transferring over to what we're seeing with, um, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So it's, it's, it's weighing on a number of sub-Saharan um, sub African nations, and it is, of course, being reflected um, in these uh, purchasing managers index uh, figures. We move on from that to the International uh, Red Cross. You were just talking extensively about the attack, latest attack in uh, Kaduna. They are saying that the, um, they are saying that, I think it's, well, let's look at the table, 329 million, I believe, was it 329? No, 346. 346 million Africans are facing severe food insecurity. It's a 20% increase from 2021. It was estimated at 286 million last year. What are the causes? Insecurity, climate change, rising fuel and food prices, which is also caused by the uh, Ukraine war. Uh, I mean, you can take your pick. Nigeria, insecurity, uh, the Tigray region in Ethiopia, um, as far as climate change, droughts in South Sudan. I hear there's a milk shortage right now in, um, in Kenya because of drought issues. There's a milk shortage there. Um, I mean, you, so it's, look, the arable land issues that are causing farmer heads, uh, headsmen cl uh, cl clashes um, in, in Nigeria. It's just, it's all over the place. So this is a, it's a severe crisis. It is, you know, something that the International um, Red Cross is raising the alarm about and says that something definitely needs to be done. Finally, uh, MTN, according to sources, MTN Group is looking to spin off its fintech um, division, and apparently they are talking to JP Morgan um, to, as far as getting an advisory role on how to spin that off. According to Ned Bank, Ned Bank is a, a, a bank in South, South Africa. Africa, they valued, I think, the fintech division, I think it was about six or seven billion dollars, if I remember correctly. So, um, I mean, this is something to where, I mean, Rufa, you talked about this extensively, right? To where the potentials of that fintech spin-off, the revenue can generate as a standalone, possibly being listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Yeah. The, the revenue streams are endless with where things are going. And that's our, uh, that's our update. I mean, if they spin it off successfully and they've got JP Morgan in it, I posit that it might be probably their biggest revenue stream. Because right. when you look at revenue for telcos, uh, year on year, it's been shifting. So, you know, formerly it used to be the bulk of issue come from net calls and the like. Right. But now it's from data. Indeed. That's where they make the bulk of their money from. So fintech is like the future. And guess what? They've got the database. Because what do you need for fintech? Database. Mm. MTN has got the database across Nigeria, across Iran, across most parts where they operate in Africa. Yep. And some other markets they are in. So they've got the database. And once you can put those offerings in it, then it goes one step further. The sky's the limit. The sky's, in fact, yeah. it's the starting point. It's right. stratospheric. Right. And that's the essence of technology. And that's where it's going. And that's why, you know, Everybody should jump on this bad one because it's technology and it's quickly changing the world. Such a disciple. No, but it's oh, true. Yeah. Oh, it's, 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 it's changing tech the world. Tech guy over here. Yeah, because, you know, because you see, here. the amount of data you're exposed to is unparalleled. It's just like you saying Amazon starts up a fintech company. Amazon has got data like for days in the world. Amazon, Amazon cloud. The cloud Amazon is cloud. incredible. AWS yeah. has yeah. got data. So Huge. once they harness this data, and it's the power of data, they can market to you, they can send it to you. It is on parallel. I bet 
I bet if they, if they start up this fintech thing, you, you will drop your bank account because they've got your phone data. They've got everything about you. It's got the bank span. They've got I'll your bank. I'll keep you posted on that. <laughs> but regarding the um, PMI, that's the word I was in, acronym. I was trying to remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, okay. PMI, yeah. why did um, South Which Africa manage to... The trend. There was an increase in private sector activity um, linked to re reducing COVID restrictions. That's the reason why. But it actually masked, um, it was said that that actually masked some other underlying issues that South Africa is facing that are similar to other nations. The inputs, so input costs, when you talk to manufacturers, which is what in the purchasing managers index, when you talk to manufacturers, there's a, an employment subsegment, there's an input, the cost subsegment. Some of the other subsegments saw rich contractions. So this is an overall number, but if if you look at some of the subsectors, South Africa is still facing some of those pressures as well. Was, okay. Was, so talk uh, about uh, this uh, report, uh, data indicating that uh, African countries have been adversely affected by the war in Ukraine. I think it's a no-brainer. Mm. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's obvious. It's yeah. your face. And the point was uh, eloquently made by Dr. Ngozi okonjo in a recent interview with the BBC when she said on account of the impact of uh, the war in Ukraine and also, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic, that the WTO, the World Trade Organization, has had to review its projection of economic growth outlook for 2022 from 4.7% to about 2.5%, almost about half. Mm. And she made the same point that African countries are mostly affected. With regard to Ukraine and, uh, and uh, Russia, Russia, Russia is the gas station of the world, okay? So between Russia and Ukraine, they export about 45%, uh, 40 percent of wheat that is consumed in the world. Ukraine is the largest exporter of uh, corn, or is it maize, they call it. And the biggest consumer from Ukraine is uh, Russia, right? And then there are also a number of metals and other uh, iron products, yeah. iron uh, uh, products, yeah. you know, coming from that part of the world. Uh, Germany takes 40% of its gas uh, from uh, 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 Russia, Russia yeah. the same with uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, and some of those other countries uh, in, uh, you know, Central Europe. So definitely the entire world is uh, affected. But whereas some of those other countries, you know, may have the capacity to be able to deal with the adverse effect, the challenge is the poorer countries are likely to suffer more. Yeah. And that's the effect we're seeing. In Ghana, bread, the cost of bread has gone up. Okay, we're even going about 45 minutes too far. Here in Nigeria, we're already seeing the effect. The pump price of fuel has gone up. Uh, uh, bread has become very ex expensive. The cost of living has gone through the roof. Even in the United Kingdom, which takes only 3% of its gas uh, from Gazprom, you know, uh, and it has alternatives from the northern uh, sea, they are also feeling a part of the effect, even if they say they can cushion whatever. But mm. the world is suffering from a global supply chain uh, crisis. In Kenya, input and output charges have gone up, okay? So Kenya may not have increased its uh, interest rate, but Ghana has had to do so, mm -hmm. the highest rate in six years. South Africa, trying to deal with the same problem, has tried to uh, suspend fuel tax for about two months. So the main challenge is uh, to go back to uh, that interview with BBC by Dr. Ngozi okonjo is how poor countries deal with this challenge because it's not likely to develop, uh, disappear overnight. And secondly, the quality of leadership that these, the le leaders of these poor countries uh, bring to the table. And she was suggesting that with regard to the food crisis that you talk about, further compounded by climate change issues, environmental issues, that maybe while uh, the, all of this crisis is going on, we should try to develop our own local varieties. Uh, the only problem with that, I suspect, is that uh, some people who are used to imported conflicts, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to calling, look to Are my you calling rights. somebody out? Are you, are you calling <laughs> I, someone I'm out? To look to my how, how do you even know somebody drinks conflicts? <laughs> uh, well, place. well, uh, <laughs> Doctor uh, imported uh, <laughs> materials, you know, that uh, are food-related. Yeah. They, they, may, they may not... Uh, Right. Uh, understand this uh, backward establishment. It's about policy, right. trying to stay ahead of crisis, in my view, in this regard. And I hope African leaders will engage in more rigorous thinking uh, so that those who are used to foreign foods, 
you know, uh, for uh, imported uh, bread. Uh, uh, can we be going to eat our <laughs> cassava bread? No, thank you. Uh, Dr. 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 Patsy, you're right about management. And I think so far, well, touch wood, we're doing better than Peru. Would you look at what's going on there with their protests yeah. against the fuel prices and food prices? Mm. People have been killed. Yeah. Yeah. I think a protest in Spain as well, right? That's, yeah, that's, 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 that's nobody that's died in Right, right. Yeah. They've so, in Sri Lanka. Yeah. The protests everywhere. No, but you know Sri Lanka is a complete basket. Oh, yeah, right. Your tax That's it. Classic case for leadership failure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Just, yeah. Now for an update on the COVID-19 pandemic, Adeswa Omarwa is here with us. Good morning, Adeswa. Good morning, Tunjun. Good morning, Rafai. And good morning, Dr. Bati. Nothing really passes Dr. Bati up to your meal. He knows those, <laughs> that, those that are taking imported conflicts. At least he's not mentioned me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good morning, guys. And let's look at the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Well, there's been a 16% decline in COVID cases around the world. And that's according to the WHO. But we should have the Johns Hopkins University, Charlie, to help us look at uh, the broader figures this morning. The WHO says from the week of 28th of March to the 3rd of April, uh, there was a 16% decline. That translates to over 9 million cases for that period. It also says that the number of COVID-19 deaths has decreased very sharply, uh, some 43% decline, and that translated to uh, just uh, 26,000 deaths uh, compared to what we saw in previous weeks. And the WHO also says that all its regions of the world are showing decreasing trends in both cases and debts. That's a very good sign. Uh, at the moment, there are over 10 point, over 11 billion doses, beg your pardon, 11 billion doses of vaccines have now been administered around the world. And in Nigeria, in its latest release, the country recorded 48 new infections and no deaths. Uh, the cases were reported from Lagos, Rivers, Kaduna, Ibia states, as well as the federal capital territory, Abuja. And to South Africa, yes, South Africa has ended its national state of disaster. It's the legal framework used for two years to impose restrictions to combat the pandemic. South Africa had one of the broadest um, measures in place, including a ban on cigarettes and alcohol, if you remember. Well, now sport venues can take up to 50% of capacity with people who show proof of vaccination or a negative PCR test within 72 hours. Most restrictions will be lifted, but people will be required to wear masks in indoor places. Uh, international travelers must provide proof of vaccination or a negative PCR test done within 72 hours. So note of caution for those who are traveling to South Africa any time from now. And away from that, millions of people in Shanghai will continue to live under lockdowns as officials have backtracked on plans to ease restrictions after more than 13,000 COVID-19 cases were reported in a day. You recall that a two-stage lockdown was imposed last week in China's financial center after the city's largest COVID-19 outbreak there. Officials had planned to leave the lockdown in the city's western district yesterday, but the restrictions have now been extended till further notice. So we do not know when that will end. In the UK, uh, nine symptoms, including fatigue, headache, sore throat, have been added to the official NHS COVID-19 list. Uh, they joined the three symptoms of a fever, a cough, and a loss or change in taste or smell. Extending the list may help reduce infections by helping people detect whether they have COVID. However, it comes just days after those free tests were taken away by the government. Very few people uh, can access free testing for COVID in the UK at the moment. So the latest uh, list will include uh, shortness of breath, feeling tired or exhausted, an aching body, headache, sore throat, a blocked or a runny nose, loss of appetite, diarrhea, feeling sick or being sick. Uh, this list is coming two years, perhaps late, because we've had other organizations such as the WHO, the U.S. CDC, and even the Nigerian CDC having longer list of symptoms. Back to you guys. Well, let's, try with, let's start with Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai, as of Monday, as of Monday had over 13,186 
1,186 uh, you know, cases of uh, asymptomatic cases. And uh, that was a rise, sudden rise from about uh, 11,000. And 311 cases were recorded. And as a result of this, uh, the uh, government decided that the staggered lockdown that was originally planned uh, will be further extended. Uh, in line with uh, what China calls the zero COVID uh, approach. Uh, it's not only in Shanghai that you have this lockdown, but Shanghai is strategic as a major commercial and industrial part of the country. 26 million uh, people, that's the population. And that 26 million population is locked down. Even dogs are not allowed to walk on the streets. No transportation is allowed. But there are persons who have been uh, trapped in their offices for more than 48 hours because they've been locked down to go only for testing, three different levels of uh, testing. So this is the thing about the zero COVID uh, you know, policy adopted by uh, uh, China. And it has affected you know, uh, uh, this uh, city of uh, 26 million people entirely locked down. Similar restrictions have been put in place in Shenzhen, in the Jilin uh, province, in the northeastern part, close to uh, uh, the Hong Kong uh, part of uh, of that uh, region. So, but all of this has asserted criticism from the Western press that the zero COVID uh, policy at a time when other parts of the world are opening up uh, will amount to a violation of uh, you know, human rights. Well, to leave that and go to uh, uh, South Africa. South Africa has the largest case of uh, uh, COVID-19 in Africa, a population of 60 million people over 3.7 million cases of infection, over 100,000 deaths uh, since the case uh, you know, was reported. So the highest zero prevalence in Africa. And South Africa has uh, you know, imposed one of the strictest you know, restrictions measures in Africa, including a ban on the consumption of uh, alcohol and cigarettes, and also on uh, nightclubs. But now you know, uh, South Africa is opening up uh, this has generated some uh, excitement among uh, the business and the tourism sector, and particularly among uh, consumers of alcohol, uh, who can now uh, freely indulge uh, themselves. But there are basic uh, you know, uh, restrictions still. In our indoor places, persons are still required uh, to use uh, the mask. The sporting arenas, clubs, uh, restaurants, you know, will now be easily uh, accessible. But at the same time, the health authorities are saying COVID has not dis disappeared. People should still uh, take whatever precautions that they can take. And President uh, Siri Ramaphosa, you know, in addressing the country, uh, made this much clear. But what comes to mind is, uh, you know, the determination with which the South African authorities have faced this challenge. Uh, South Africa today remains one of the identified hubs for you know, uh, vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing in Africa. They were ahead in the fill and finish uh, process, you know, uh, in, in Africa. They were also ahead in uh, helping the world first to report uh, the discovery of the uh, Omicron variant, even if that brought them some embarrassment. So even as uh, South Africa uh, relaxes these measures, I think what we will remember is the proactive response of the government and uh, it should be noted that even the opposition parties in South Africa are praising uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, you know, uh, for taking this uh, decision. President Ramaphosa, beyond South Africa, you recall, uh, as chairman, as chairperson of the African Union, also support, you know, that COVAS facility initiative, the AVAX, you know, initiative uh, promoted by the African Union. Well, the opposition parties had been putting a lot of pressure on the South African government to end this state of disaster a while ago. But it's, I think, commendable that they held out this long to ensure that the science actually supports any change in policy, which we've often complained about at this why haven't we? When people put politics ahead of, you know, the science, they haven't done that. So I think it's good news all around, although there's some that are quibbling over that requirement that still remains for children over the age of five who are not vaccinated to show up within a, with a negative PCR test within a space of 72 hours. And because South Africa is such a tourist hub and popular for family holidays, 
tourism in South Africa might suffer if parents still have to ensure their children are vaccinated. You know there's an argument about that. Or pay for those expensive tests, which some people just don't want to do. So some are even pushing that it should go further and just completely exempt children altogether. I don't know what you think about that. Well, when it comes to this pandemic, we'll become more Oliver Twist. We ask for more. Mm. Um, but you've <clears> rightly <throat> said so. South Africa has been badly hit, and they've just been very cautious. We know that this virus also affects children, however, in a different way. But it doesn't mean that they are not carriers of infection. So uh, the, the debate is on. There are countries who are vaccinating <coughs> as low as... Uh, children younger than five years old. So mm. I, I guess the South African government is sticking to their gun and they will see it done. All right. I just want, real quickly, <clears throat> I just want to ask, I want, hope most airlines have gotten the new revised memo of COVID-19 protocols now because there was a big embarrassment that happened in Dubai on Monday and an airline failed ignorance. I said they were not going to pick Nigerians in. It was a big brouhaha. And this was some people ended up paying over 23000 after they said, and these were fully vaccinated people, for a test that the protocol said they should not do again. And the airline feigned ignorance and said because they were going to be such a... So I hope all the airlines have gotten the memo now. Well, we do hope so. And it's something we would bring up with the authorities once we have... Uh, a chance to do so because fully vaccinated travelers coming into Nigeria do not need to do any of those tests, uh, either pre-departure or post-arrival. So no airline should be asking for them well, to pay for that. However, you have to register on the government website. So you should show proof of uh, travel permit and your full vaccination certificate. That's all you need. But they paid the money because I have evidence to that effect that somebody, people pay that money. And that's anyway, the sad part. It's, it's not just the airlines, uh, Adesua, who are not aware of the new protocol. Even in public places, when you go to uh, some places, they still insist that you must wear the mask compulsorily. Whereas the Nigerian government has said it is optional. Mm -hmm. So what I think is important is communication, getting the message out there, uh, so that all of us, government and the people, can be on the same page with regard to those protocols. Thank you very much.